So good morning everybody. It is now November 6 on a Monday and I'm sitting here at 8 in the morning in my office and I'm ready to do a really crazy analysis on Elliott Wave and using trendline analysis on EOS. But I want to start at the beginning, okay guys? I've spent a lot of time analyzing it, probably about four hours now, and I'm finally ready to get started, okay? We're looking at the beginning of time, okay guys? We're going to look at it from the, when the supernova began, the big bang. That's when we're going to look at it from. So we're going to count this Elliott wave first of all. One, two, three, four, and five, okay? So for those people that are new to Elliott wave, I want to actually get started and show you guys the structure, okay? One, two, I'll do it from down here so it's more visible. One, two, three, four, and five. And then for every pattern like that, there's always a corrective pattern such as this, okay? There's an A and a B and a C correction, okay? Someone commented on my YouTube saying that I should be doing it on a higher time frame, but I want to correct that person and let you guys know as well that these waves, they, they're also known as fractals, okay? They're found on every single time frame, whether you're looking at it on the daily chart or two hour chart or even the one minute chart as well. These waves are always found no matter what. And it's, it actually incorporates fundamental analysis and also technical analysis into it. Someone has also said to me that Elliott Wave is only useful for looking into the past. Well, why would we use Elliott Wave to only look into the past if it doesn't help us with the future, right? So obviously when we look at Elliott Wave, it definitely evaluates and does an analysis in the past, but we always look in the past to try to predict the future. Does that make sense, guys? So regardless of what anyone says of using the higher time frame, absolutely you can do it in a higher time frame. But know that within this first wave, there's also five waves inside of here, for example, okay? And then I'm gonna zoom in even closer if I can. So then within, within this wave, for example, okay? Within this first wave, there's five waves going in there. And don't mind the angle. Don't mind the angle. Actually, I'll, I'll make I'll stretch it out so you guys know what I'm talking about here, okay? So let's angle it out like that. And then within this first wave, if it wasn't a higher time frame, there's five waves in here as well, okay? And then within this wave, there's also, you know, there could be five waves in here as well. That is just how Elliott wave works, guys. Okay, and then within this wave, if you look at a higher time frame, I can't angle it anymore, but you guys get the idea. And then within this one, even though it's a correction, there's an ABC inside of it as well, right? So that is how Elliott wave works, guys. So without further ado, let's get into this, okay? We're going to count from the beginning of time. And once again, that Elliott wave incorporates all types of analysis, okay? When there's fundamental news out and the market is driven by it, we can still easily do an Elliott wave count. So this is my personal preference of evaluating and doing an analysis on a chart. It may not be something that you guys like, right? It may not even be something you have to respect. But the fact is, I think that most traders who are successful, they will acknowledge several different forms of analysis. And this one happens to be my absolute favorite one. If you guys have uh, a chart, you know, um, that that might contrast mine, no problem. I'm going to be very, very, very open-minded and I'll always consider things from every different opinion and perspective because that is what a successful trader does. He or she does not stay closed-minded, right? I think intelligent, I'm not saying I'm intelligent, but I'm saying intelligent people in general, what they will do is they will take information with a grain of salt and they will evaluate it, right? And they'll take information from multiple sources and then they'll eventually formulate and conclude their own opinion. So make sure that you guys take this with a grain of salt as well. I'm sure there's many, many different methods to, to evaluate and analyze this, okay? So now that we have this five wave structure in here, this is what we know, guys, okay? We're going to go to our daily chart now, okay? And then after we got that five wave structure in there, we waited for an ABC correction and that took forever, okay? We're gonna call this basically wave one going up. And then this right here, we're gonna call this A, B, and then C. There's no denying that, right guys? We got, we saw five waves up there and then we ended up, we ended up um right here. So. It almost retraced actually to where it originally began, which is crazy. Yeah, pretty much right there. So we have our ABC correction. Now this right here, all of this that you guys see right here, 
that I'm going to draw is basically the first wave of three, five waves. And I'm going to zoom out really far for you. Now, we don't know how long this correction will actually take, but to zoom out for you and give you an idea, right? This is basically the phase that we are in right now. We are in the first wave of the five waves, okay? From what we see, I'll draw exactly like how we see it right now using the same angles just to give you guys an idea of how we can be, okay? Now, I'm not saying this is a price target. Once again, this is just an example, okay? Now, we have five waves like that going up, okay? But this one is usually much, much, much stronger, okay? Now, for all we know as well, okay, for all we know as well, it could be something like this as well, okay? This wave one could be really big because wave three in general is always, always bigger than the first wave going up, okay? So, for example, it could be something even like that, okay? So, we could even be on this particular one, and all of this will basically make wave two, just as an, ex as an example. And then in here, we could be on very well the first wave of the fifth wave, right? One two, and then three, and then four, and five. So once again, this is just giving you guys an idea of what's going on right now, okay? I entered a pretty massive short position from around one... Okay, I'm going to show you guys something that I predicted. Actually, it's not even worth the time, but I predicted it so well lately in the past few days, and um, it's been a very predictable chart. And we'll get into that later. But I want to show you guys, first of all, that I think we are on the first wave of the first sub wave of the fifth wave, okay? You guys need to put that into perspective, okay? This is the first big wave going up, right? Right here. I think that we are on the first sub wave of the first wave going up of this big wave right there. I'm gonna say that one more time for the new viewers that may not understand it. I think that we are in the first wave right here of this first the, sorry, the first subwave of this first wave right here of this entire big yellow wave right there, okay? So we have a long ways to go. And the reason why I think this is because, well, if this was wave one, two, three, four, and five, just based on proportionality, well, it would be smaller than the first wave. And I will tell you guys something right here from an Elliott Wave rulebook, so no one can even dispute me, okay, guys? Wave three is often the longest and never the shortest of the three actionary three waves going up, okay? I'm gonna say that again. Wave three is often the longest and never the shortest. Basically what they're saying is wave three is always longer than wave one. And that wave one is usually the shortest. It doesn't have to be the shortest, but wave three is often the longest and never the shortest, okay? So basically, if it has to be longer than this one, just, just using basic Elliott wave principle theories, right? Okay, now that we have this out of the way, we want to micro-analyze this, okay? We want to micro-analyze all of this and see what's going on. Now that I've got a lot of time to, um, I've had a lot of time rather to take a look at it. Okay, so I'm going to count my wave like this. I'm going to count my wave like this, and I think it makes a lot more sense. One two, three, four, and five, okay? And I'm gonna go over every single fractal with you guys. So for all the naysayers that will disagree with me, okay guys, for all the naysayers that will absolutely disagree with me, I'm gonna gladly make sure that you guys understand this as well, okay? And that's very important to understand. So, in here, what we have is an A, B, C, D, E correction in here. A, B, C, D, E, okay? And this is in a flat pattern going like that, right? You guys all agree with me? I th there's, it's hard to disagree, right? When this is the A, B, C, D, and E correction right here. Or even what it could be, actually, no, we're going to keep it like that, okay? This one here. We're going to count it like this. One, okay, are you guys following? A, B, and C here. Two, this is basically three, okay, and this is four, right? 
and this is actually five right here for a very truncated one. And that can very much so be possible, guys. It can 100% be possible where this huge wave there needed a massive, massive correction, okay? And I know that it retraced into the territory, sorry, territory of wave one, but that's all right for this particular one because of how large the actual impulse is. But we can barely call it retracing to the territory of wave one because it was just one big spike rather than the body of a candle, right? Right. Alrighty, now that we have that out of the way, what is this big mess right here, okay? Well, that one here, if you guys notice, did a A, B, C, D, and E correction. If we actually look at here as well, we'll notice a very similar type of structure. We have an A, we have a B, we have a C, we have a D, and we have an E right there, guys, okay? Does that make sense right there? Absolutely, 100%, okay? That is the A correction pattern coming down right here. So this right here, which I would draw for you guys, I'm going to remove this first now that we've seen it, okay? Oh, sorry, my apologies, my apologies, I screwed up there by accident. This is actually four, and I, I meant to say, um, I meant to say this actually, okay? Let me just backtrack for a second here. This is A, this is B, and this is C right there, first of all. And within this particular wave, what we have is an A, B, C, D, and an E, okay? We have a correction, a five wave, okay? Five wave coming down right here. That can be very possible. Now, let me show you the guidelines of a B correction, okay? Let me show you guys the guideline of a B correction. Just to get you guys caught up on Elliott wave as well, okay? Right, match. I want to find a more detailed photo. Da, 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 da. Sure, this one will do right here. Okay. Do you guys see right here coming down to A? We usually have a one, two, three, four, five pattern. And this is from an Elliott Wave textbook. Okay, guys. And a, a lot of people are disagreeing with the way I'm analyzing with Elliott Wave. So I would just want to pull up an actual textbook and let you guys disagree with that, maybe. Okay. But instead of having one, two, three, four, and five here, we had an A, B, C, D, and E there where it overlapped each other, right? Basically a small type of flag consolidation. And then going upwards, we have A, B, and C, okay? Let's see if we can find a better photo in here for you guys. So we have three against the trend, right? That's what it says there. Uh, let's see. Give me a second. You guys need to know exactly what we're doing, okay? Because I want you guys to learn Elliott Wave as well. There we go. Here's a decent photo for a zigzag. Five coming down. One, two, three, four, five, okay? And then we have a one, two, three correction from A to B. Now look at this. What do we have, guys? We have an A, we have a B, and then we have a C, okay? This one going up here, some people will argue where I just drew as wave one, but nah, we're not going to call that as wave one. We're just going to call this an ending part over here instead, right? That's just all part of this is an A, B, C, D, and E, okay? You guys, you guys look in here. I mentioned earlier that within fractals, or there are many, many different fractals within a wave. So if you guys actually look at this one right here, you'll actually see A, B, C, D and E, right? You guys all see that with me, okay? So this one, we're getting a three wave structure coming down. This one, we're getting an ABC corrective pattern going up, okay? This one, you can't see it on the 15 minute, but it's basically a three wave. I'm just gonna show you guys it actually. You can barely see it, okay? You can barely, barely see it right here but you get a three wave structure coming down okay and this is part of a part of a pattern called a flat okay right there you have abc in there if you zoomed into a um, sub minuet frame you can see the five going up there and then we have the a b c d and e coming up here we have basically an a we have one two three four five for the a up there we have an A, B, C coming down here, right? And for the final one, we should have also five. One, two, three, four, and five for the C correction right there, okay? 
And then finally, what we have is this right here. So what we have is a leading first wave, one, two, three, four, and then five, okay? This is called a leading first wave, right? And then we have basically a two correction right here, A, B, C, A, B, C, okay? You guys following that so far? And then we have another wave three coming down right here. We're just gonna call it one. Actually, I wanna be accurate and call it the right thing. A, B, C, D, and E. And then I wanna call this one. And guys, this is, this is evaluating it from a five minute time scale, okay? So it might be a tiny, tiny bit off, right? But I challenge anybody to try to evaluate Elliott Wave on a sub minuet time frame. It's fucking hard, guys. I'm telling you, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time and energy to do this, okay? So don't even try to attempt it at home if you guys don't have a lot of time. And this one right here, we have basically one, two, three, four, and then we get one gigantic fifth wave in here where there are so many different fractals, I'm not even gonna try to count. But basically what we have finally is this, one, okay, two, and then we have three, and then four, and then we have five, okay? And this five pattern, do you guys know what it actually makes? Let me show you, okay? It actually makes, if I draw that again for you guys, from one, two, say three, four, and then five right here, what that actually is in an A, B, C, D, E correction as well. A, B, C, D, and E. It's basically a huge correction with the side of a correction. So you can count it as waves one to five, or you can actually count it a different way if you'd like as well. Either way, they're both acceptable in my books. But the most important thing for us to know is that this is the ABC correction, and this is the proper count now that I've had tons of time. Okay, this is one, two, sorry, one from here, one, two from there, this is three, this is four, and that is five. Are they satisfactory waves to fit the Elliott wave rule? Absolutely, they are. There were five waves up in here. There's an A, B, C, D in here. There's a five wave up in there, big drop, not even close to a double top. And we call this a truncated fifth wave within a subwave of three, okay? And then we have our A, B, C correction here, just to keep it very simple. A, B, and then C, right? And now what we're doing is basically this mumbo jumbo right here, okay guys? This is a big mess right there. Now that the first impulse wave is done here, okay, we can just call this one for now right here. That's wave one right there, okay? And now obviously we're gonna have some sort of ABC correction, right? We're gonna have some sort of ABC correction. And now the hard part is figuring out what everything is going on in here. So let's assume that this was just two for now, okay? Let's just assume that was two. And let's even assume that this was A, B, C. We can even assume something simple like that. A, okay, B, and then C. So we're gonna make some assumptions, right? Is this C right here? Or is there still a bigger C in play right here? So we can draw a channel. Okay, let's draw some channels here. Let's get rid of a lot of this stuff. We don't want it to clog. This makes sense, right? If we draw a channel, guys, with some resistances, now, I made many, many calls on my Twitter that I hope you guys actually caught, okay? The call on my Twitter I made, I want you guys to hear this right here, what I called out on my Twitter. I want you guys to hear it loud and clear, okay? Ready? So, for example, this one here I called out, oh, it was, oh, was going to hit a dollar eleven, right guys? I'll show you guys how I knew it was going to hit a dollar eleven and then start a small correction, okay? You take this base range right here, right? And then you bring it to over here and then you set it as a target because that's the wedge range. Now the next target will be this particular wedge right here. And then that's where the breakout is, right? And then if you guys notice, it actually hits the resistance as well. So the next target after this correction will be around a dollar sixteen, okay? A dollar eleven and a dollar sixteen, okay, guys? That's exactly what I said. 
And I'm going to zoom into this particular area right here for you guys, which hit exactly $1.11. And then it hit $1.16, guys. Okay, now I want to show you one more part. I want to show you guys, and this is this is not me, this is more me still explaining to you guys, so I don't have to repeat it again, exactly why I knew it was going to hit some specific targets. And how did I know it was going to tank after? I incorporated something called Dow Theory, okay, guys? Listen. Five R. Listen, guys. Right now, right now, and also the 85R side, the 5-minute chart, side, the five minute chart can't even get higher, guys. To me, this, to me, is, a this is a very typical part of a Dow Theory, Dow theory short, accumulation short accumulation phase where investors, where investors are not ready to take the market, take the market, yet, because market yet because they're loading up on their long, long, long positions to catalyze a big dump on the market. On the market. But they're creating but they're the FOMO stage where, you, where, where people are also buying into their short positions, right? So when they catalyze a big dump on the market, guys, they'll lose money that way guaranteed, right? But they don't care about that. The because the profit is made from closing, closing their short positions at the bottom. At the bottom. So, they so they might be losing, say, 2-3%, right, by, by dumping the market, dumping the market and, selling and selling it at market levels, levels whatever, whatever, but they might be, but they might be making 5-10% to 10 at the bottom, at the bottom when they close their shorts. So what I was saying first of all, okay, is this. I want to show you guys how I knew this was a downtrend and how we were going to break out of it, okay? Just to give you guys the power of TA. So first of all, we didn't know any of this stuff yet, okay? We clearly, clearly saw a, a resistance right around here, right? This one wasn't drawn yet either. All that we had was basically this point right here. This area right here. And this is what you guys should always be doing as well for TA, okay? All that we had was this area. And what I told people how I knew it would hit 11 is I took the base range right here. And you guys should exercise this practice every time too, okay? You take a price range for your base range right around there, okay? And then you, you, you take it to where the breakout pretty much is. Actually, I was overly generous there with that, I remember. I was very conservative and I kept my box inside of here, just like that. And then I put it to the breakout right there. How did I know it would hit $1.11-ish? Basically from here. I might have I might have used a little bit of a different uh, different area, maybe something like that, but that's what my target was at that time. And surely enough, it hit exactly a dollar ten, a dollar eleven. Okay, guys. And then after this point formed, okay. After this point formed right there, what I did was this. Let me show you guys. I also just did a Fibonacci extension, trend-based Fib extension. You take it from point A. Whoops, wrong tool here. You take it from point A to point B, and then you go to point C about, okay? You go to point C about, and I was actually shooting for one-to-one, -one, but I automatically assumed that it would not hit a one-to-one, -one, and instead what would happen was it would hit basically these resistances right over here, okay? So if I drew a line all the way to here, to where my resistances are, and I connect this these points basically, that's how I said to myself that this is going to hit a dollar sixteen as a major resistance point. And surely enough, we saw it, right? Just shoot through there. I actually put in my limit order just up there. I didn't think it would reach a one to one ratio because that would imply it would break out. And on the hourly, sorry, on the daily, it was way too high already, guys. It was it was way too high already. It needed to re I needed to correct. In fact, right now it still needs to correct, guys. Like this is. I don't think it's going to be skyrocketing anytime soon right now, okay? But I want to go over how you guys could have known that it was it was um, basically time for correction, okay? So once we have counted this five waves, one, two, three, four, and five, it's downtrending time, guys. It fits the Elliott wave profile. It is now time to downtrend. So what people should have done is they should have entered a short position, right? Do you guys know what this tool is? If you guys don't know, I'm going to explain it to you really quickly, okay? This tool right here is a short tool to tell you the risk and reward, okay? It tells you the risk and the reward associated with, with um, the position that you enter, okay? So the red zone is like right here, the middle line where the green and the red meet. What that refers to is your entry price, okay? So if you enter the price, you just bring it to right where it is, and then you drag this up and down, okay, guys? To where your stop loss is going to be and make sure you stick to that stop loss guys no matter what okay and then the next thing you would have done 
is taken an entry point like this from your Fibonacci extension from where it started, okay? Go all the way up to over there to where it ended. And then you would have set your first target basically at 3A2. And surely enough, you guys see it bounce slightly off of the 3A2 region, but it actually just shot down to the 0.5 region right here, okay? Shut down completely. Now it went back up and it tested that resistance line that we drew, how I told you guys how to predict that one. And then it shot back down to the 0.5 level, okay? What you guys would have done is taken your short tool and did that, okay? You would have shot for a 0.5 Fibonacci level or, or here, right? You could have shot for here, close your position, right? And then when it bounced off of there, you could have played another short. So basically what this means is for every EOS coin, you're risking the top one here in the red. For every coin, you're risking, you know, the seven, uh, 0 0.0797 on dollars per coin. But you also have a possibility to gain 32.25 cents or 20, 23% you have a chance to win. But if you hit your stop loss, you have a chance to lose 6%, okay? Now, let's look at this risk to reward ratio. Do you guys see where it says 4% right there, okay? This is your 4% risk to reward ratio, okay? Now, let's do some basic math, okay? Obviously, this is about 25%. That's about, you know, 6%. It's, it's four times more, okay? We're gonna do some basic math and we're gonna, we're gonna flip a coin, heads or tails, against a friend, okay? Now, you're flipping, we'll, we'll just say, you know, the same price. The same price, guys. The exact same price is uh, as an EOS coin. So this makes sense. One dollar um, loony, you know, in Canada, we call a one dollar coin a loony. So for every win, this I'll show you what this means, okay? Then you're going to play 10 games, heads or tails, flip, okay? For every win, if you win the coin toss, one win is equal to, um, in this case, is going to be 25 cents, right? Because here, we have a chance to win. We'll say, we'll just make it an even number, 25%, and here will be a quarter less, okay? 25%, we'll say 24, whatever, 24. Yeah, we'll say 24. And then a loss, I'm just trying to do the math in my head, equals you have to give them a quarter of that, okay? Because the risk to reward ratio is 0, 0.6. Does that make sense, guys? Right here, okay? We're keeping it simple like that. Now, out of 10 games, if you play 1,000 coin position, okay? 1,000 coin position, right? So if you won, if you won, you would win 1,000 coins times at 0.24 each, right? Or we'll say 1.24, put it that way. And that equals $1,240, but a loss is equal to 1,000 times, unfortunately, you're going to lose six cents on each one, right? So we're going to pull out a calculator just really quickly here, which is, which is basically 6%, okay guys? which is basically a 6% loss. So we're just gonna keep it simple and say times 0.094, okay? And that's gonna to equal to $940, okay? So you have a chance to win $240, but you also have a chance to lose $60, okay guys? Does that make sense? That is what the risk to reward ratio means. But if we kept it in even simpler terms, let's say you flip the coin, heads or tails, 10 games as well, but this time for every win, right, you can win a dollar. You can double up your money, we'll say, okay? Actually, you can win four dollars, we'll say. You can triple your money, uh, quadruple your money. But for every loss, you would lose one dollar, which is the same as risk to reward ratio. We call it RR equals four to one. Does that make sense? Because you can win four times more, right? But in our particular case with EOS, it just comes down to, um, it comes down to, to a smaller prorated amount, okay? Now let's say again, out of 10 games, okay guys? Let's say you won 10 games, um, you won three games, right? And each time you won, you won $4, okay? At $4 each, how much does that equal? That equals $12 over three games. Now the other seven games, 
at a $3 or $1 loss each. I should be clear here in my notes. $1 loss each, okay? So if you played seven games and you lost seven, and you, or sorry, if you played, um, if, if you lost those seven games and you lost a dollar each, how much would you lose? You would lose $7 over seven games. But 10 games total, right? That's $12 profit minus minus $7 loss is equal to a $5 overall uh, total profit, right? Do you, does that make sense, guys? So this is how we play the stock market like a casino, basically, right? We are playing it like a casino. We are using the game of probability to win over time. So if you kept, uh, if let's say every single time, okay, you guys had a chance to win and you were playing the exact same positions up to say $1,000 and you had the exact same chance to win the same percentage, right? Same percentage as in 25%, you know, versus a quarter of that. If you chose those setups every single time, guys, and you kept your risk reward ratio of four to one, over 10 games, even if you lost, guys, even if you lost seven games and you won only three games, you would still be incredibly, incredibly profitable over time, okay? But now let's say we ended up cutting this short and we cut it to a two to one ratio, okay? A two to one ratio like that. So now instead of winning $4 each time, we'd actually be winning only $2, right? And then let's say we, we won we won, I don't know, four games and we lost six, okay? 40% win, $2 each time. And then, so if you if you played four games, guys, and you won, uh, sorry, 10 games and you won four, and each of the four games you won $2 each, that's $8 over three games, right? But if you played those other six games and you lost, well, you're still, you're gonna lose $6 over six games. Does that make sense? So out of 10 games total, well, that's actually an $8 profit and a $6 loss. And what's your profit overall still? It's still $2, okay? Does that make sense now using a two to one risk reward ratio? I'm gonna do this in every single video, guys, because you guys need to understand. And if you play a $1,000 position every single time and you had a chance to win the same percentage every single time, okay? Every single time, say you had a chance to win I don't know, 11%, we'll say, and you had a chance to lose 5.5%, which is half of that, you guys would, no matter what, be profitable over time, even if you lost four games, or sorry, even if you lost six games. So what's the win ratio here? That win ratio is only 40%, right? But just based on simple math, you guys will still make a lot of money over time. I mean, let's add some zeros to this, okay? Do you guys see what I'm saying? Let's add some zeros to this, right? If you won $200 each time at 400, right? That's gonna be um $800 win, okay? $800 win, and you lost $100 each time. That's a $600 loss, okay? And that's gonna be 10 games. That's an $800 profit and a $600 loss. And your total is a $200 profit, guys. So if you added a few zeros to this and played some big positions, you can make some serious bank, guys. So once again, this here, guys, this pattern is incredibly important to recognize, okay? And we're gonna clear all this shit, okay? We're gonna clear all of this. All that we know, first of all, is a few things. We know this line, okay? This is not even formed yet, and I'm gonna highlight what we have not even seen yet. That area, we haven't seen it yet, okay, guys? This is invisible to us right now. All that we know about, okay? All that we know about is, we'll say this area, but what we can do, not this area, but only in the black, the highlighted area is something we can't see. So what we do is we just draw a line right down here, okay? Just draw a line straight down across. And then what we do is we see this point and we see this point, right? Okay, right guys? So we're just gonna, we're gonna draw some more things in here to draw some resistances from right here and from right here. Now that we see this area, we can draw some more trend lines. We can draw a trend line like that, okay? What do you guys notice? What do you guys notice just from the areas that we see? What we see right here is this very clearly, right? We, we can draw a triangle from, from right here to right here, and we just extend it. That is what we see, guys.
okay? So we draw a line from here just to get a huge support line, okay? Or resistance line, rather. We draw this one coming down because we saw these points and we saw this point, and we draw another one on, the, on right here, right there, and right there, and right here, and just draw it across. And what do you guys notice? You guys notice a rising wedge. Now it's less than time, guys, okay? It's less than time. Okay? This right here is bullish or bearish. This right here, right there, is bullish, okay? This one, despite it looking like it's going up, it's going to do this type of pattern right here. It's going to do a one, two, three, four, a five, and then it's going to tank. This one right here, once again, it's um, this one is called a rising bearish wedge. This one is called a falling bullish wedge, okay? So what we do for that one is like this. We draw a coming down one, two, three, four, and five. And then once it finishes its pattern, boom, it breaks out of it. Okay, guys? So let's see if we can actually draw something right here, okay? Looking at this one right here, let's see if we can actually make some relevant points, okay? We can even draw it a little bit tighter like that because we have this point and this point, right? Would you guys agree that we can draw it tight? We're going to count five coming, coming down just like this one right there, We're counting down one, two, three, four, five. If we can count five points, that would be an excellent one to play, right? One, surely enough, two, <coughs> three, four, and guess what, guys, five. Not only, guys, did it make five, okay? Not only did it make five, but it made five identical points, basically, with almost the same angle and symmetry. Would you guys agree with that? Isn't that insane how symmetric it is? So that's how you guys would have played this particular position. And then you would have done basically exactly what I suggested earlier, which is to get your base range, okay? You get, I'm trying to find the tool, excuse me. You take your price range, say in here, as a base range, Okay, and you can just use this one as a target from where it breaks out. Just as an example, just as a target, right? or sorry, from right here, as a general target, right? And surely enough, it pretty much hits that point, and we'll move this over so we can see we're working with that area now, okay? And then you use your Fibonacci extension right here. So as much as I'm doing technical analysis to forecast, I'm also going to teach you guys how to play positions that have happened in the past. Because once we look into the past, we know how to look into the future. And you guys looking back on this to how easy I made it look for you guys, right? Well, take these as lessons learned and make sure that you guys try to remember them. Write them down in the notebook, okay guys? Write them down in the notebook for what I'm trying to help you out with here. And I just want you guys to improve your trading. And by explaining this to you guys, it actually helps me improve my trading as well. So once again, I'm gonna say it, okay? All we saw is this right here. Nothing in this box we see, okay? I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna clear it all again. You guys are gonna be like, holy shit. Draw line going like that because it just connects these points, okay? So we don't, we don't know any of this yet right here, guys, nothing, right? But we, what we do see is this, this point and this point right here, okay? We're just gonna connect some lines like that, right? Just draw some resistances and supports. We don't even know what's going on to here yet, okay? We're just gonna pretend we don't know. But what we do see is this right here forming, right? As, it, as this starts to form more, right? We see it falling when we're like, hey, this looks like it's squeezing, doesn't it? You take out your one, two, three, four, five tool. Oh, wow, that's one point. Oh, wow, that's a second point. Holy cow, the third point is so symmetric. No way, it can't be a coincidence that the fourth point is also that symmetric. No way, that's what you guys were thinking. And then you're like, wow, if there's a fifth point somewhere down there, it's definitely gonna break out, okay? And surely enough, it absolutely 100% with certainty broke out there. And then you take your base range once again. I'm gonna keep saying this stuff over and over until it's drilled into your heads. And then you use this as, usually you do it from right here, just for the people that are very technical and they're correcting me. You Usually you do it from right here, okay guys? You put it on the breakout and then you shoot for this target. But 
I knew it wouldn't hit it because it was just too high to break this resistance. So instead, I took my Fibonacci extension tool, okay, Fibonacci extension tool from point A to point B and point C, and I just targeted a beautiful number of around, around the 768 area or even 618 area or even right around the resistance area. And that's how I literally called it out like you guys saw on my Twitter. Not only did I call this area here at 111, but I also called out the 116, right? And that's just from using good technical analysis, right? And then I said right here, this is the important part, okay? Right here, there was a big stall. People thought that it was actually gonna go up, okay? Right here. People thought it was gonna go up higher, but I knew a few things. I knew, one, it was a major resistance area, and this is part of a Dow theory accumulation phase for short, okay? The reason why you guys see, you know, it hover and hover and hover for a long time is because investors and bigger players, they'll actually buy very slowly, guys. They don't do these massive, massive, massive market executions until we're in a phase called the excess phase, okay? So there's a few phases, right? And the biggest one is the accumulation and the pub public participation phase, okay? During that phase, guys, they actually go very slowly to create FOMO in the market. And right here, we're just hovering here, we're hovering here to create FOMO in the market, and they want people to buy into a long position, and they're the ones who are putting up buys, okay, guys? They're the ones putting up buys to go long, believe it or not, okay? And I'll explain the logic behind this strategy. <clears throat> so they're putting up orders to go to buy because they want to trick you guys into thinking that it's going to go higher, right? Does that make sense? But what they actually want in turn at the same time is they're also putting up bids or sorry, they're putting up asks so you guys will fill their short position at the same time. So not only are they accumulating on their exchange position, right guys? They're accumulating their exchange position, but they're also putting up asks so their short positions are getting filled up. And the reason they want to do this to go into a long position is because they can dump on the market to catalyze the process, okay? And then a lot of people definitely thought they were going to go long there because we would see tons and tons of walls on the bid side stacking up, right? So naturally people would be buying as well, be buying as well. And these guys know, the big players know, guys. And I, I do it myself, you know, I do it myself all the time. Who am I shitting, right? So I'm not saying I'm a big player or anything, but I understand the psychology behind it. And I'll absolutely stall as well if I actually want to put in some really big positions ranging from anywhere from 10 to 25 to even 50,000 sometimes, right? So then now that their short positions are getting filled or they're happy with it, and now that their long positions are filled on their exchange account, what they'll do is they'll dump the market, guys. They'll dump the market really, really, really hard, right? And, and they'll lose money that way. 100%, they'll lose money dumping onto the market within their long positions, but they might have anywhere, they might take a loss anywhere between, I don't know, 2 to 3%, right? But that doesn't matter to them because we play it like a game of probability, guys. And what ends up happening is they make all their profit on closing the short positions. So even though they lose 2 to 3 to 5% on their short position, they might actually be gaining... 10 to 15% on, or sorry, in their long position, they lose two, three, four, five percent by dumping the market. But their short positions, when they close it, they might be gaining 10 to 15%, right? So you don't win every single trade. This is a game of chess after all, guys. And we have to make moves. We are all direct competitors, okay? Remember that. Whenever there's profit taken, it comes from someone else. Whenever there's profits or whenever there's losses, right? Someone else takes our profit. So right here, absolutely, absolutely 100%, guys, that they want to trap people into thinking that it's going to go higher, right? And then what ends up happening when people think that it's going to go higher is that they'll dump the market, and then the people who have held long, they realize, oh, shit. Well, there's two types of people. There's the people who will just keep holding and be like, oh, it's going to bounce back, it's going to bounce back, it's going to bounce back. Basically, the people who are amateurs or newer traders and they don't know what a stop loss is, right? And I always talk about stop losses. Let me just have a sip of water. <clears throat> they don't know what a stop loss is and they'll just, you know, let their emotions take over. And then there's the better traders who are like, 
And these traders are, are the good ones that I like. They're the ones who realize, oh crap, I know what a stop loss is. I'm actually gonna cut my losses short right now, okay? So they'll cut their losses short from their long position, but in turn, when they cut their losses, right? So if you're in a long position, you obviously have to sell, right? But when they cut their positions, if it's leverage or not, and they dump their position on the market, or they usually will dump in the market, it adds even more strength into the downtrend, okay? Does that make sense, guys? So not only are people catalyzing the process by dumping a large amount, and I do it all the time too, you know? I'll gladly put in both orders simultaneously at the same time because I understand the market conditions and the psychology of it. So then I'll dump the market, I'll dump the market, and I know that people are gonna dump the market as well. Sure, I'll lose a few percentage, but when I close my short position here, bam, I will make up for that loss no problem, and I will work with the market. So I hope I'm giving you guys some insight on some more advanced strategies that goes on in the market. Not only, guys, so as soon as this candle form, guys, this is called the inverted hammer, okay? This is called the in motherfucking inverted hammer. If you guys ever see that candle on an uptrend, you guys close your position, okay? You guys close your position and you, actually, I'm just going to look for like a shooting star or something. Sure, we'll call it a shooting star candle. Some people call it that. It's easier to find. Okay, right here. What the psychology behind it is, the bulls have tried very hard to push it up, and then the bears have pushed it all the way back down, creating a very long wick, right? It might be called an inverted hammer as well. Hey, if you guys actually have not looked at my video yet, make sure you guys take a look at my video on candlestick formations, okay? Yeah, I decided to start making some tutorial videos just to let you guys um, get a little bit more insight in addition to all the various sources out there as well. And I talk about how I trade using candlesticks. And if you're a very basic trader, it actually goes over a lot of detail ranging from how to read these candles all the way to how to incorporate into a very basic strategy as well. And I cover topics ranging from um, you know what a doji is, what an inverted hammer is, what are three white soldiers, what is one black crow, what is a small doji, what is a shooting star, what is an evening star, right? how to also combine it with moving averages. So definitely check it out, guys, if you haven't already. I think it is an awesome video series that I'll be making. So yeah, as soon as we saw this inverted hammer, and it also could not break that resistance, guys, it's short time. You know what I'm saying? It's short time, guys. That's what it is. So now that we have this wave structure, one, two, three, four, five, this is what I think we were at, okay, guys? If this is wave one right here, okay, and this is B right here. And now we're we're making our way to C actually. If we just clone this, right? And we draw one down here. Does not look proportional. Let me show you guys. Does not look proportional. A let's let's look at a big one. Excuse me. Just don't mind the weight, I'm sorry. Come on. There we go. How does that look, guys, okay? We have five going up there, which is making wave one, and then we have an A, and then B, and then C, right? Make note of this right here. One, two, three, four, five, and then we have A, B, C, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, and there are many, many different fractals within fractals, okay? So we have one, two, three, four, and five. There's no denying that. And here we actually have an A, B, C correction. A, B, C, okay? And here it looks like it's actually making the first wave already. One, two, and we'll just call this one three, and then four, and then five, okay? Now, now that we have this point right here, A, okay, and this point is B, let's call this C, we actually have exact targets. First of all, I want to clarify this right here, okay? That's A, that's B, there's C. That's no denying that, right guys? There's there's no denying we see this and can call that Elliott wave. Now what we're going to do to be very precise, guys, is this. We're going to use our Fibonacci trend-based extension, and we're going to go from the top wave here, 
So you take it from the top point, you take it to the next low that we see right here, all right, to the next low that we see, and then we click it to the next high, which is B. And then what do you guys notice right over here? This target right here, this is actually the one-to-one -one ratio area. I'm just going to delete all these lines. Check that out. This is one-to-one -one right here. We always take a ratio. If this is wave A, we will assume symmetry that wave C right here is actually a one-to-one -one ratio. So where are we targeting, guys? You guys are have probably been wondering. Based on my prediction and my Elliott wave analysis, which which could be very much so right, but at the same time, right, things can change all the time. So make sure you guys take every information with a grain of salt, okay? That I think we are gonna make it to right here in this range. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw this again here. I'll include 718 and 618 as well. I think that we could basically anywhere from here, guys, is is possibility okay anywhere from here now we can even get a more accurate indication okay now that we have this wave and this wave we can use our trend base extension again to get some pretty crazy targets there and right over here guys okay whoops one two three right there and I'm gonna delete this big one okay Check that out right there. If we got a one-to-one -one target, wave three hits right there, guys. Right here, same as here. But if we use a one-to-one -one target from up here to up here to where B is, one-to-one -one target of wave three is there, okay? And then the one-to-one -one target is right here in this particular box. So make note of this price, guys. I think we are definitely going to hit it, and I will tell you why. So it's anywhere between 73 cents and 85 cents, okay? Check out the daily chart, guys. You guys think that we can sustain it? Come on. Look how crazy that daily chart is, guys. We are, we're, at, we're at 70 right now. On the four hour chart, sure, we're getting a little bit of support, but because we just ended up bouncing off of B, we're going down, we're starting leg wave two, okay? I firmly believe that is gonna make this type of pattern, and I'm gonna, I actually shorted it as well, guys. I shorted it right now, all the way from from right here already, from that top, at a dollar six, dollar seven, because I have no I have no reason to believe that this is in an uptrend based on Elliott wave counting. Okay, guys, I have no reason to believe it, because if I look even on the one hour chart, guys, what do you guys see? You see bearish divergence, right? You see overall bearish divergence from right here. Overall, even if we connected it further from the highest point over there. Is that crazy how that much is that much is a resistance? Let's look on the two hour chart as well, okay? Here, sure, it looks like it wants to cross over guys, but we look at some trigger charts, charts right now, okay? Some trigger charts, sure. It might cross over a tiny bit because it's still within the, doing the fractals, within the fractals, right? But that's still A, B, C from what we see. And we see a lot of different mini waves. But the important thing to remember, guys, to take away from all of this is that the RSI is 100% diverging. Why do we see a bottom here? Because this is point A, right? And then we moved up to point B. Why did we see a bottom here? Because this is where the fractal wave, subwave one ended and we were moving up to two. But overall, look at that divergence on the bear, on the RSI there, okay? We're already getting this type of candle indecision. And look right here, guys. Remember earlier I was talking about the shooting star candle? That right there is a shooting star. We got it. What it indicates is that the bears have won. The bulls have tried to push up really high there. That's why there's a long wick. But the bears successfully rejected them. Bam! Down right there. Okay? That's what just happened right now. And basically, if we take a resistance line now from C, look at this. Just bear with me and check this out, guys. Okay? I'm going to take this right here. Okay, this line, this one, this one right here. I'm gonna put it right there. I'm gonna clone it, okay? And I'm gonna see where point B was right there. I'm just gonna move it over right here. What do you guys see? You see a resistance right there. See, this is what we always have to do, right? We have to look for similarities 
because yes, guys, Elliott Wave predicts the future by analyzing the past, okay? And I've shown so many times how we're able to just draw simple lines using Elliott Wave count. And like that can't be coincidence, right guys? It cannot be coincidence that I literally just cloned it and moved it over and, and it, it formed the shooting star at the resistance. Shooting stars don't get rejected, guys. They're one of the most powerful candles. You guys know what I'm talking about. They're, it's such such an amazing, an amazing formation. And it's just a matter of time now before we downtrend. This finishes our wave one right here. Let's see if I can see more fractals within that wave. One, two, pretty much three, four, and then five, right? And now we're doing our wave two. This is basically doing our A, B, C, D, and E. Or, or a leading diagonal rather, but either way, there's many, 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 many fractals within inside of a, a subwave. So regardless of anyone says, guys, oh, you should only be doing Elliott wave in higher time frames. Sure, if you don't understand the basics of Elliott waves and fractals and subwaves, absolutely you should. But like I've demonstrated, there are so many waves within subwaves, right, guys? So yeah, so I'm expecting a downtrend. I'm expecting 100% a downtrend. Okay. Let's see if anyone else agrees with me. Let's go to trading view. Okay, guys, here's one of the ones that I found the most accurate to mine. It uses a very complicated method of analysis, which I respect. And at the same time, it's not for me, but he seems like he knows what he's doing. And I'm actually excited to follow him on trading view because someone in the Telegram channel said he was fairly accurate. He's using TD sequential, right? And he's targeting anywhere between 63 and 75, okay? I'm being a little bit more optimistic than him. 63 and 75, okay? My target is between 73 and 81 about. And I'm allocating myself a huge region. If I averaged it out and took the bottom of exactly where my one-to-one -one ratio is, it's actually 71 and about, and about 60, 77. So yeah, like there are a lot of people that are agreeing with me. That's just not one guy. There's many people, right? Not only that, we want to target some good Fibonacci levels. Fibonacci, Fibonacci, Fibonacci. So we take our Fibonacci tool like that. And you know, it couldn't even be 84 cents because the FOMO is incredibly strong. But guys, because of this wave here, this one, two wave there, the strength of it will actually imply based on the Fib extension ratio that three will hit over here, okay? And then five, if, if it was the same thing, we'll probably end up hitting this box right over here. And this is over a few days, guys. This is, um, my date's not even on here. That's shitty. I don't know why my time's not on here. Do you guys notice? Let me reload the page. There we go. Now it's on there. So the, this is around November 7, November 8, okay? So it's a far, far down the road. We're just gonna slowly, slowly downtrend here in my opinion. But what can happen, guys, I wanna be very clear about what can happen, is that we end up getting basically a C like that, okay? And this one is a tiny, tiny wave, right? Super duper tiny wave. And then, you know, we're not even gonna count one, two, three, four, five there. We're just gonna count this as a double bottom because it is possible to get a double bottom, guys. So we have to make sure we look at a lot of indicators. But here, it's only from the six to the seven, guys. What's more real realistic to you guys? Let's play out the scenario, okay? Is it more likely that tomorrow, tomorrow, right, if it double bottoms, because based on how the, the strength are on the six, do you guys think it's likely for the daily R side to reset so we can make some new highs? Or do you guys think it's more likely for us to hit it maybe on the 7th, okay? Now let's go look on the 7th, for example. Oh, sorry, not the 7th. The... Yeah, I guess the 7th. Around there. This might be a little bit more angled. Something like that. Maybe 8th or the 9th. On the 8th or the 9th, you know, it's... Uh, we could actually make some quite quite a bit of ground. Based on how this is angling right now, this is draw it straight down, okay? This one will hit around the attempt, you know, it won't bottom that much because we're still bullish. But right here, let's say it ended up hitting, bouncing off of a, a, new, a, a bullish zone still, so say 40. Even 50, we'll say this one will land on about the 9th, guys. September, sorry, November 9th, okay? in the 50 bounce zone where there was currently support here before. 
So if I took this support right there, and I'm expecting it to bounce off of the 50, right? This one almost coincides somewhere between the 8th to the 9th as well. So guys, I've shorted. I'm confident to say that position of mine. I am not a financial advisor in any way. Okay, guys, I'm not here to give you guys advice on what to do with your position. I'm not here to tell you if you should hold it or sell it or accumulate because the way I trade is really differently than you guys, right? I trade by managing my risk. I don't see it as in buying one position and then and then selling somewhere, right? I see it as slowly accumulating and managing my risk over time, slowly, right? So if I need to shed some shares because there's more risk, I'll do that, which I'm gonna get into so much detail in my future tutorial videos that it's gonna be, it's gonna be amazing the amount of material that's out there. So I'm gonna conclude this video. You guys know where my targets are based on an Elliott wave and trend line analysis. You guys also knew how to play some positions like the wedge that I drew there for you. You guys also knew how to read that shooting star that formed on the one hour candle right there or the inverted hammer, right guys? And now you know some price targets as well based on extensions of Elliott wave one to five. So if you guys haven't seen my other videos yet, definitely check them out. I'm creating a tutorial series. The first one was how to customize and set up Bitfinex. And the second one, guys, was how to read candlesticks, okay? So if you guys don't know how to manhandle those them with tricks, make sure you guys go check them out, okay? I, and the last thing I always say at the end of every video is that I really appreciate all the love and support that you guys have given me. And I always set up a little tip address at the bottom there. If you guys love my dog, you know, and you appreciate what I'm doing as well, help me contribute to her vet bills, basically. I keep a little piggy bank for her just for an emergency fund because you never know what can happen. Okay, guys? So Luna and I, we send our love to you guys. Have yourselves a great day, and I will see you for my next video. Bye now.